section of the book of Romans. And uh, in my mind, practical can be uh, a little bit more difficult than doctrine. And what I mean by that is uh, to understand doctrine and to put doctrine into practice, it requires two things in my mind. It requires, first of all, that you have wisdom. You need to have the wisdom to know how to apply the doctrine. But second of all, you have to know the doctrine. So the reason I say that the practical is more difficult than the doctrine is because first you need to understand the doctrine to then understand the practice. You need to understand the doctrine to understand the outflowing of, of the practice. And, and I think uh, that's exactly why in the book of Romans you find all the doctrine comes first. And then Paul ends the book of Romans with the practical side of things. And we, we see the practice in the Christian life, in our daily life and in our mind and in our thinking. And, you know, it takes an adult to live and think in a way that we put that into practice. So if you note back in uh, chapter 12, verse number 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. So it's that the renewing of your mind, this, this adult in us as we grow in the Word, that enables us to be able to put it into practice. An adult has to be someone who is renewed in their mind, right? You can't have an immature person be an adult in the Word. It's someone who's been renewed, who's studied, and is renewed in their mind. And when I think about myself, I, I think that, I think about, you know, I spend so much time studying the doctrine, and I spend less time studying the practical outworking. And I'm not saying that's right, because it's not. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's wrong, but... I am saying that if you know the doctrine, it should be easier for you in the practice, in, the, in, in, in putting that into practice in your life. I think as Christians, a lot of times today, uh, people put the cart before the horse, right? And uh, in a lot of churches today, it's all about how do we practice Christianity, and they have no idea what the doctrine is. You know, as Tom's been talking about in the book of uh, Corinthians about knowing what foundation you're building upon. Today, we have Christians who are just out there doing. They're trying to do the practical outwork of the ministry. They have no idea what they're building upon, and they don't know what the doctrine is. So, um, verses 1 through 7 of, of chapter 13 are dealing with government and putting yourself in subjection to it and the powers and institutions uh, that be. And uh, some of the things we'll look at is, where do we as Christians with a heavenly citizenship fit in with the role of government? And what is that relationship supposed to be like between us and that earthly government and the powers and authorities that are set up here? And there's an important reason, I think, why Paul puts this issue of government into the book of Romans. And, and uh, you know, at first it might seem a little bit out of place, but I think after we study through it, you'll see the reason and the purpose why Paul has put it there. And then the second half of the book of Romans 8 through 14 deal with the issue of kind of how we rate, relate to society in that. So the first half is government, the second half is, is us in society. How do we relate individually? And what is our attitude and responsibility towards the governing authorities? So verse 1 of uh, Romans chapter 13 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So you notice, first of all, it says, let every soul. Every soul. So this is not something that's optional, because every person is a soul, and so everyone is under the power of God, will, rather, will, regardless of whether they make themselves under the power of God willingly or not. We're all under the power and authority of God. And if you don't willingly submit to it today, there's going to come a time when the wrath of God comes and every soul will be made subject to the power of God, you know, whether they choose to be or not. Um, you see where it says to be subject. What does that mean? Go back to Romans chapter 8. To be subject means to, to submit yourself to, right? You think of medieval times and you have a king and you have subjects. Well, what are they doing? They're making themselves subject. They're making themselves, they're submitting themselves to this higher power. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, 
for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So in, in this context, the carnal mind hasn't submitted itself to God. You have the carnal mind in the flesh. It's not submitted itself to God because it can't. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. But when you come to Romans chapter 13 and it's telling you to be subject to the government, this is something that you can do. You know, the carnal mind is warring uh, you know, against the spirit and against God and it doesn't have the ability or the power to do that. But when you come to the book of Romans here and he's telling you to do this or when you come to chapter 13, this is not something that uh, within yourself that you don't have the ability to do. This is something that you can do, making yourself subject so there are certain laws and principles for the operation of government that you can make yourself subject to and subject to those authorities who put those laws in place. And the reason why we are to be subject to, that, to those laws and institutions that God has put in place is because that they were put there by God. Because if you see there again in verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. So we know these things are flowing from God, and we'll take a look at how God has put those into place a little bit later. But one thing I want you to see is, what are those higher powers? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Well, what is it we're supposed to be subject to? What is the higher power? Turn back to John chapter 19. The book of John, the gospel of John chapter 19. In verse 1 of chapter 13, we see that it says that those higher powers are ordained of God. And in John chapter 19, verse number 10, it says, Then saith Pilate unto them, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest, so you have Christ here, right? He's before Pilate. And Pilate's saying, You're not going to speak unto me? You're going to remain silent? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? So Pilate is, he's offended, he's perturbed, that he's got a man standing before him, he's wanting to question him, and the man opens not his mouth. Pilate's frustrated by that. So he starts to exercise his power and authority and say, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I can do to you? In verse number 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. He just put it right back in Pilate's face, right? And told him, listen here, buddy. You don't have any power in and of yourself. You're just a man. Everything that you have was given to you from above. So these higher powers are given from above. So don't turn there, but Psalm chapter 62 and verse 11 says that God hath spoken once, Twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. All power belongs to God. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 15 and 16 says, By me kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. Everything that's put in place, all of those kings, all of the nobles, all of the judges, they get their power from me. That's where it comes from. Man doesn't have any power and authority uh, on his own. So uh, now turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Just to look a little bit more into the fact that verse 13, uh, or chapter 13 of Romans verse 1 says, so we just looked at what the higher powers were. They come from above. They come from God. And he says, for there is no power... Uh, for there is no power but of God. Matthew chapter 6. And it's good to get a, uh, you know, the, the first Christ coming and, and saying these things and looking at what he's saying about the power as he willingly subjected himself on earth here to the will of the Father. And here he is talking about the power. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 13 says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. Who's he, he, who's he praying here to? This is Christ praying. He's praying to the Father, right? And he says, For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
The power is of God. It's His kingdom. It's His power. It's His glory. And everything that we have is derived from that. You know, when we talk about how Israel was to be the blessing to all nations, and when you think of it in that context, everything that the nations got, everything that the Gentiles got, were the overflowing from Israel, right? And when you think about the power and the authority that man has here on this earth, it's nothing in and of themselves. It's everything that's overflown from heaven above that's flowed over down here to man and what we receive from those blessings. All right, so back in verse 1, it says of chapter 13, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And what I want to try and get through through the rest of this, uh, this morning is to what degree should we be subject to the government? We, as individuals, underneath this authority, if I pose the question to you, to what degree should we be subject to the government? Because, you know, there are many great people in the Bible who disobeyed the government. And did God punish them or did he reward them? Turn back to Daniel chapter 3. I want to take some time to look at a few examples. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 9. Daniel 3, 9. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Now, first of all, you should be a little bit leery whenever, whenever anybody tells you that, right? Second of all, the people who were telling this, you have, you have Nebuchadnezzar who is now taken, he's, he's got power, sitting in Babylon, he's the king. He's the authority. He is the ultimate authority upon the earth. Okay? Now his governing authorities underneath him that he has put in place has colluded together because they don't like Daniel, and they come to Nebuchadnezzar, so these are the government's and authorities. It's like the governors of the U.S. coming together with the president or the senators coming with the president and saying something. All right. So I want you to keep in mind, these are the governing authorities and powers, not just random people. Thou, O king, verse 10, Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast said over the affairs of the province. You think that maybe some jealousy got in the way here because they didn't like the Jews? You've put these Jews in positions of power and authority. Look at what they're doing. You know, they, I don't think that they like that very much. Uh, affairs of the province of Babylon, their names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. That, old, that golden image was set up by the king, by the ultimate power and authority in the land, and he commanded the people to worship it. He said, that this, he was using his authority to set that up, right? Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Is it true that you haven't submitted yourself to my authority to obey what I told you to do? Now if ye be ready, I'm going to give you another chance. Maybe you just didn't hear me right the first time. Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, Flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, if you do it, if you sub subject yourself to my authority, then everything will be all right. We'll just forget this ever happened. But if you worship not, ye shall be cast that same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Uh oh. Uh oh. Do you remember we just showed that all power and authority comes from God above? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're so sorry. We realize that you are the authority in the land and we should have done what you said. No, it says, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We're not, 
We don't care about ourselves. We're not careful in the way that we answer you. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Or if we to just condense that down and simplify it, we will not submit to your authority and subject ourselves to the things that you are telling us to do in this instance. Turn uh, to uh, Daniel chapter 6. <laughs> There's a couple of words in this, this passage that we're getting ready to, li- to read that I, I, I really love. And, and when you look at the example that Daniel sets, I'll, I'll tell you about it when we get there. So, Daniel chapter 6, verse number 4. Now again, we're going to have a situation. Well, let's just read it. Daniel 6, 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Now once again, what's the, the governing authorities, the higher powers in this kingdom of Babylon, the presidents and the princes? These are the people underneath the king, the people that the king has set up with power and authority in his kingdom. They sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, these governing men, these authorities that are put in place, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then the presidents and the princes, our Congress, our senators, our governors, they all got together and they assembled together to the king, the highest authority, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. Uh Uh-oh. All the presidents, you know they're up to something, right? All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains. Think about all the people how that trickles down into all the different levels of authority there they had in Babylon, from the top all the way down. We've all come together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing. It's an executive order. They put it on the desk of the president It's signed, sealed, and delivered. The king signs off on it, that no man shall do this. This is the law of the land, and everybody is made known. It's made known to everyone in the kingdom. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. You know, you get the photo op, and they've got the pens out, and they all sign it, and everybody gets to take home a pen, and it's a wonderful political thing. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, you know it's important that God put that in there, right? Because now we know that what Daniel did was in full knowledge of what the governing and authorities and powers had put, it in, had put in place. So what he's doing here is willful. He went into his house and his windows being open. Windows open. Windows open. In his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. It didn't matter what the governing authorities said. It didn't matter what they put in place. Daniel was going to do what was right. He did just as he'd done aforetime, even though the government and the ruling authorities put something in place that was wicked, he still did the same thing he did beforetime. And did he go into his bedroom, his chamber? Did he go into his closet and shut the door so that way he could do it in silence? with nobody being able to see? Did he do it in secrecy? No. Those words in that chapter right there are some of my favorite words in Scripture. Windows open. Openly. When he took a stand for God, he didn't do it and say, oh, you know, that's my faith, but I just don't talk about it, and therefore if there's something going on in government, I'm just going to shut the door in my closet, and I'll I'll just worship God on my own. No, when Daniel took a stand for God, he did it with the windows open. Just as you and I, you know, if if we're going to live for God, we don't do it in the confines of our home. It's not a personal faith. This is a life-changing faith that you have. 
It is life-changing, it is experiential, and it is rooted in the doctrine of the Bible, and it should be lived out in every moment and every way in your life and in your practice. So, uh, turn back to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. So we've had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've had Daniel. Let's get some women in on the action. Exodus chapter 1 and verse number 15. Exodus 1.15, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives. Who's the one doing the speaking here? The king of Egypt. Who is the ultimate and supreme authority and power in the land? The king of Egypt. We have the governing authorities here. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife, what's that? They're going to deliver the children, Right? He said to the Hebrew women, And see them upon the stools. If it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God. And did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but, 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 aren't they supposed to make themselves subject to the powering authorities? Aren't they supposed to do whatever the authority says and puts in place? But the midwives feared God and did not, as the king of Egypt, the ultimate authority and power in the land, commanded them, but saved the men, children, alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Now put yourself in their place, okay? They feared God and they chose to do right, no matter what the consequences were. And they would not murder the innocent children as they were coming out of the wombs, despite what we do in this country as they come out of the womb. And the king of Egypt calls them before him. Now they know that they had just disobeyed the king of Egypt, and he's calling for them. How's that going to make you feel when you're getting ready to walk into the presence of the king of Egypt, and you're going to be held accountable for not doing his will and not subjecting yourself to his authority and doing what he said. How do you think they felt at that moment? Put yourself in that position. The next time you have to do right, the next time you have to make a choice between between what's doing right and what's doing wrong, and you say, well, it's uncomfortable, it's not the best situation for me to do what's right. You know, it's easy for me to just go this path of least resistance, or, oh, it wasn't me, I was just doing what I was told. So that way, if you're, a, if you're an SS officer in the concentration camps of Nazi, in, in Nazi Germany and you execute people because, and, your, and your excuse was, well, I was just doing what I was told. Well, that didn't stand up in the trials of Nuremberg when we in this country had some justice remaining in our, in our frame of reference at that point when we told those officers that's no defense for the murdering of the innocent and we held them accountable for their actions. But put yourself in the place of these Hebrew midwives as they're coming before the king of Egypt, who they defied his authority, and he says, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the wives come, midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt negatively with the midwives? Did he, did he chide them? Did God give them a hard time for not subjecting themselves to the authority and doing what they were told? Did he chide them for maybe telling a little white lie? Forget the white lie. Did he chide them for telling an outright lie? Therefore God dealt with the midwives. God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. Were they punished for what they did? No, they were not. So they disobeyed the government, and they were rewarded. Daniel disobeyed the government, and he was not rewarded, right? He was thrown into the lion's den. He could have very well lost his life. 
God intervened in that situation? Is that the way he's working in the dispensation of grace? No, no. But you still do right. You do right and risk the consequences. Now turn to the book of Acts. Why did God reward them? Why did God reward them? Is this a contradiction in your Bible? Where Paul says to make yourself subject unto the governing authorities? Or to the higher powers, excuse me. Turn to Acts chapter 5. The answer to the question can be found in the Bible itself, as is always the case. You have a question, you look to the Bible for the answer to the question. In Acts chapter 5, it says this in verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men... So let's talk about who the one and the them are. So the leaders in Israel, the powers and authorities that were in place in Israel, and we know that they're the powers and authority because what did Christ tell the people? He said, they sit in Moses' seat, whatsoever they do, you know, whatever they say, you do, right? And so we have the, the governing authority, or the ruling powers in Israel, and there's one of them... Then came one and told them. He's coming and telling them now, the, the rulers in Israel, saying, Behold, the men, now the men are the twelve apostles, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple. So these men, the twelve apostles, the, the rulers in Israel, told them, Don't preach about this Christ. Don't preach about the Christ, because they didn't want this message spreading. So they were trying to shut them up. They were trying to put a gag order on them and say, Don't teach about this man. And what did they do? They put them in prison. God got them out of prison. And what did the twelve apostles do? Ah, oh, we need to subject ourselves to us. We see there's a punishment if we don't follow the governing authorities. So we should probably either just flee or just shut up altogether. No, you know what happened as soon as God got them out of prison? Where did they go? They went right back to the synagogue. Is right where they went. Then came one, verse 25 again, verse 5. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. So they put the, you know, the apostles here, they put Peter before the council, the council. That's a council, right? You have a city council. It's like a, a governing authority. They put them before the council, the authority that they're held to. And so Peter comes up. They, they, they put them before the council. And the high priest asked him, now who's the high priest? Is that a power and authority? Absolutely. Saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So he just tells you what they had already told them. They had told them not to preach in this man's name. So they are disobeying what the powers and authority told them. This is another civil disobedience. Now that makes four that we've looked at this morning. Civil disobedience. And the answer to why God rewarded those in the Old Testament, and even if he didn't reward them, the answer between what is doing right is found in Peter's response to the high priest and to the council. Verse 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, Peter says that we should obey God rather than the earthly authorities. But you have to understand also, is that a conflict then, when Paul comes along in chapter 13 and says to make yourself subject to the higher powers, is that a conflict? Is that an absolute principle that we shouldn't obey men? And then Paul comes along and says we should? No, the principle is really this simple. The principle is that we should obey the higher powers and make ourselves subject to the government in which we live under. And we'll see that next week. We'll go into that principle in detail next week. But the principle that I first wanted to set you up with is the fact that when the two are in conflict, when God and the governing authorities are in conflict, we should always obey God rather than men. Let's pray.
Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day that you've blessed us with, and we thank, Lord, for your word, which we can study uh, to learn principles on, Lord, not only the gospel and how you've saved us, Lord, but also the outworking in our daily lives and the principles that we should establish our lives on. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you promise not to be late for the church service, there are some donuts from Blake's in the hall. So please help yourselves. I think we have enough for everybody, but just in case we're a little short, first come, first serve. But please back, be back in time for, for the church service.